to episode 39 of 100 Years of Marine Corps Tankers, a channel that was created as a way to honor the lineage and history of the United States Marine Corps armor community. Through these interviews, the stories of Marine tankers will remain the test of time and will not be forgotten. This week's interview should look very familiar as Master Gunner Sergeant Graham was last week's interview. And with the overwhelming response we got from last week, Big Top Graham has been gracious enough to come back and tell us more stories about the community's history. And with that, Master Gunner Sergeant, welcome to the channel once again, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And it's good to, good to know that people are tuning in. Yes, sir, well, for sure. Yeah, I, I, uh, I promised Colonel Wilkinson that I would make this story first. And uh, when I was a gunny, I was uh, sent to Cuba uh, as a platoon sergeant of the tank platoon. And Lieutenant Wilkinson was my platoon commander. And he had not had a platoon sergeant for probably six months. So you know how that can affect lieutenants. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing he did is he took me in my office and showed me a, a stack of papers, honest to God, three feet high. And he says, uh, you need to take care of all this admin work. So the first thing I did was I opened the window of my office and I threw all the paperwork out the window. <laughs> and I said, I don't do paperwork. Well, that, that, that was a little bit of a stunner. Well then, and this is the first day now. And then uh, uh, Noon Chow comes and he says, uh, Gunny, I'm going to chow. Clean up my office while I'm gone. Mm. No problem. So he goes to chow. Well, during chow, I had the troops come in and take every single thing out of his office and put it out on the ramp. The <laughs> desk, his wall locker, you know, photos, chairs. The office had absolutely nothing in it. And he comes back and it just throws a fit. Gunny, what did you do? And I said, Lieutenant, I don't clean offices either. So, <laughs> you know, uh, leaving a lieutenant unattended without a gunny for any length of time is kind of a dangerous event. Mm -hmm. So he would spend most of his day walking around the ramp telling me things that I'm supposed to do. And finally, after a couple of days, he goes, Gunny, he said, take out your green notebook and write some of this stuff down. You ever written down a thing? And I said, Lieutenant, I'm not going to do one single thing you told me to do. So there's no point in writing it down. And that was the beginning of a very long relationship that the two of us have had. But that's his story. <laughs> now, um, you remember the other day I was telling you how I have a file mm -hmm. of really special Marines. And I, I want to start out with the with the best Marine I ever knew. And I don't think anybody would ever question me about this. And that Sergeant Major Leonard Kuntz, when he retired, he was the uh, IG Sergeant Major at headquarters. Uh, Sergeant Major Kuntz and I uh, knew each other a long time. We were uh, drill instructors at the same time at Paris Island. He was in 1st Battalion, I was in 2nd Battalion. I didn't know him personally, but I knew of him. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to uh, the Staff Sergeant Corps, Staff Academy, he was my squad advisor. And then my last mid cruise that I went on, he was the Battalion Sergeant Major. And when he was in Vietnam, he was recommended for the Medal of Honor. Wow. And it took me 20 years before he actually told me what he did. And he, he didn't even tell me. I was at his house and his wife went and got his citation and came out and read it to me. But if you ask him, he'll tell you all I remember is he was the point man of his company on our patrol. Mm -hmm. He said there was an explosion. And the next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital in Japan. Mm -hmm. But what his citation tells you is, you know how you see in these World War II movies, these Japanese cement bunkers, right. they have the machine guns. Well, apparently they walked into an ambush where there were seven of those. Wow. Well, on the initial beginning of the ambush, he lost his weapon and he ran and dove headfirst into the first bunker without a weapon, picked up an E-tool from the enemy and killed every single one of them in the bunker. My God. And then went to the other six bunkers and killed every one of them. And they, just, they did not sustain one uh, dead Marine in that ambush because of his action. 
and he was recommended for the Medal of Honor, and it was downgraded to the Navy Cross. And he says it's only because he lived is probably why that um, you know he, he got the Navy Cross. But if he walked in the room right now, you would never in a million years suspect that this is one of the true heroes of the Marine Corps. Because he's kind of a small guy and very grounded, down to earth. He's from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And the interesting thing is when he got home from Vietnam, he was gonna go hunting, but they wouldn't sell him ammo because he wasn't old enough. <laughs> go figure. Incredible. Well, just incredible. Uh, another adventure of Sergeant Major Kunsis. He was a he was a little guy. He's a martial artist, really good. And he was a tunnel rat. And he was down. I asked him when he was down in the tunnel, did you ever run into anybody down there? And he goes, Oh, yeah. He said, hmm. one time I, I got in a knife fight with a North Vietnamese soldier down in the tunnel, and a grenade went off, and we were buried alive. Hmm. And I asked him well, what do you think about when you're buried alive? You know, and he said, well, he said, one thing I, I never occurred to me was that the Marines wouldn't come and get him. Never occurred to me, you know, and they did. Six hours later. Six hours. Buried alive for six hours. And he told me he never lost faith that the Marines wouldn't come and get him. That, that's an incredible story. True. You know? And the thing, like I said, he, he wouldn't tell me the story for 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, and then finally, you know, he, he, they think he was able to, uh, his wife showed him the citation. Another, uh, and, the, and the Kuntz stories could go on and on, but I'll, 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 I'll just do with one more. Um, we were on a med cruise. My last med cruise with him was with him. And we were, had been at sea for quite a while. And one of my Marines, uh, when we went ashore in, I think it was either Spain or France. I had a little too much to drink and was carrying on. Well, at the same time, and, and people may remember this, there was a TWA Airlines that was hijacked over the Mediterranean and they went to uh, Libya. Okay. But we were right across the Med from Libya. So the MPs were rounding us up, sending us back to the ship. Well, my guys, you know, party hardy, you know, and, and uh, one of them had had a little too much to drink. So we had a little trouble getting back on the ship and had a bit of an issue with a naval officer today. And this was a corporal. And uh, the, the naval officer threw quite a fit, actually. And it, was a, it was a legitimate international incident right there in the well deck. So anyway, the next day, the sergeant major comes down to me. And he said, Gunny, he said, I got this corporal's warrant for sergeant. What do you want me to do? I said, I want to promote him, of course. You know, if the worst thing he ever did was drink too much in Spain, heaven forbid, you know. <laughs> so he said, okay. So he went back and he uh, put the warrant in amongst a bunch of papers that the colonel was going to sign and just went through them all, signed them all real quick. And, and we promoted the guy the next day to sergeant. And uh, the funny part is that he, one of the agreements was that he would go to alcohol training there on the ship. Well, as it turned out, the instructor of the alcohol class was this naval officer that we had had an issue with. Of course. So we, we told my, my newly promoted sergeant, when you go in there, take off your chevrons and sit in class and bitch about how the gunny screwed you over. You know, didn't have a chance. Every, the whole world's against me. <laughs> and he went through his whole you know, nine weeks of training or whatever and came back out and he retired a master sergeant. So life is good, <laughs> but I but I wonder with any other sergeant major, had you know this guy may have never had a career, right? You no, know, and it turned out he was an ex, you know he, he was an excellent marine, and and uh, sergeant major Coons did the right thing, and and uh, you know that's the way the marine corps should work. But while we're talking about good leaders, I have a list here actually of a lot. Okay. Of them. okay. But my my company, my first company commander in Vietnam. His name was Captain Obuck, and I was on the CO's tank for a while. And we had, had gone out on a, we were attached to a task force. I, I don't remember the name of it, uh, but we were at Camelot Hill. Mm. And we got caught in a regimental size ambush. And it was, it was ugly. It started about sunset and we fought till the morning. 
Well, the sun came up the next day. But during a battle, you know, we would push the North Vietnamese back. Then they'd push us back up and back. Well, on one of the times, uh, a squad of guants got caught and didn't make it back with us, with the, to our, our lines. So the company commander said, we are gonna go out and get those Marines because they were a lot of wounded people. And mm. one of the things that tanks used to do was carry the, the wounded Marines to the LZ, put them on the bird, you know, and you could carry half a dozen people at one time. Mm-hmm. So we, we went out and we had to fight our way through the North Vietnamese to get to this squad of grunts, it was only four people left. Wow. And so we load them up on the, on the uh, as we're loading them up, one of the other crewmen on our tank jumped off and like he was in shock. And he just started walking straight towards the enemy and, you know, in a daze, no weapon, you know, so we, I went out and grabbed him and, you know, we got him back on the tank and he was okay. But that's just an example of how bad the doo-doo was that night. Mm-hmm. Well. So we, we get this guy, uh, all these guys up on the tank, and, and this guy to this day gets the award for the toughest Marine ever. We got one, one of the grunts is up on the tank, and he's literally holding on to the gypsy rack with one hand. And with his other hand, he's holding his intestines. Wow. You know, his intestines are all out of his stomach, and he's holding them, and he's yelling at the North Vietnamese. And I'm not going to quote him exactly on your show here, but you can imagine the uh, expressions uh, that he was relaying to them, how he was going to come back and kick their ass, every single one of them, and not one of them was going to survive. And, and, but, the, but the point of that story was, is that my company commander didn't send us out to get him. He took us out to, to get him. Right. You know, and he never hesitated for one minute you know, to send somebody another tank or whatever. He took our tank and we went out and got him. And then we fought our way back. We ended up fighting the whole night long. And then I guess when the sun came up, everybody got hungry and wanted to go to breakfast. So we went our own way and we got back to Camo Hill and our whole armor deck was solid red with blood. And you can imagine, or maybe you can't, the smell mm-hmm. of blood when it drips onto the pack. Mm-hmm. You know, it is, it is. It's different, let's just say that. Right. But we had a, a ton of, of uh, gear that we had collected from wounded people and uh, you know, uh, blood everywhere. And, and the crew was actually, that was the other guys on our tank. And that was really their first battle, you know. And mm-hmm. The first one was always the toughest, you know. And I, I give people a little latitude when I became a tank commander uh, on the first firefight because nothing you can do will ever prepare you for face to face with somebody who's trying to kill you. Right. Now, you can talk all the trash you want to, but you never really know what you're going to do until it happens. So uh, another instance we're at that, that, uh, about the first firefight is we were engaging the enemy one day, a pretty long battle. And I, I was a tank commander at that time and I'm giving fire commands and nothing's happening. You know, we're not firing, we're not doing anything. So I dropped down and I looked at my gunner who was, who should be sitting between my legs. Mm-hmm. You know, he turned around and he's facing me. And he's got his hands between his, or on his face, crying his eyes out saying, I don't know what to do, I'm scared, you know? So I just leaned back and I blasted him right in between the running lights. Anchor love. Ex- yeah, expressed my displeasure with his performance and turned him around. Pretty soon now we've got rounds going down. It's no problem. So. After, you know, we got back later that day and got set in for the night and the guy come over kind of apologetic, you know, and I said, you know, it, it's just, you don't have to apologize because everybody screws up the first one. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you, you may, you can talk all the trash you want. You can say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But when the bullets start flying, everything changes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I give you the first one, but from now on, we're all expected to do our part and 99 times out of hundred, they do, mm-hmm. you know, but you, you gotta, you get, you can't crush people the first time out because they, you'll break their spirit and they'll never come back, you know, because when you're in, when you're in combat, you don't do have do overs, right. you know, but you will have another firefight. 
mm-hmm. sooner or later. And so a good leadership point that I, that I learned quickly was, you know, the first time out, just make, make your point, but, but don't destroy the guy's morale. You know, he can't break his spirit. And so, you know, that, that was the deal with that. But, um, it was a, a really funny story that that little top Frank Cadero is an insistent that I tell because this is I love this story I have told it a thousand times. It's how I became a tank commander. Well, I was on a tank and uh, uh, I was the junior corporal, and uh, uh, the tank commander, another corporal, was in the cupola. And again, we're out in another battle somewhere, and he gets shot in the hand. He has hand like on the just on the uh, on the cupola. He got shot in the hand or a piece of shrapnel or something. So he came down and I wrapped him up. I called the lieutenant. I told him what happened. He goes, okay, just put him back up in the cupola and let's go. So we did, you know, about, I don't know, half an hour later, he gets shot in the shoulder. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> comes down and I wrap him up and the lieutenants, I called the lieutenant and he said, well, he said, uh, just take him over to LZ, put him on a bird and uh, he'll become, a, he'll, he'll go on a medevac. So we did, we took him over to the LZ, got him on the bird, bird took off, got shot down. (laughs) Now the helicopters traveled in twos. So the second bird dropped, you know, picked all the crew up, nobody got hurt. Mm -hmm. But it was was just really funny though, sequence of events. Talk about a bullet magnet. Yeah, well anyway, (laughs) during the, the whole day, this is probably, I don't know, around two or three in the afternoon, and the, and the whole day I was the loader and I was down in the turret loading rounds. So I didn't know who was where, who did what, you know. And so I called the lieutenant and I said, okay, he's on the, he's on the helicopter. What do you want me to do? He said, well, you take over the tank and bring back where we're at our position, just head north. And I said, okay, north. I'm looking around and said, which way is friggin' north, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I said, okay, got it. We're on our way. So we took off obviously heading the wrong direction <laughs> and as fast as we could go. And then all of a sudden we realized we were within the enemy's camp. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember I told you my driver was a NASCAR guy. Right. You know? So I just told him to get us the hell out of here. So we're shooting in all directions, you know, and, and I'm sure that the NBA were probably in as big a shock as we were. Like what are these morons doing here? You know? <laughs> so we, we get back and we, we, uh, I got finally linked up with the platoon. And so that night the lieutenant comes around and he goes, you guys have any trouble finding us? I said, not a bit. We just drove right to it. It was a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> Minus the bullet holes. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, really. You know, and it was just, and we probably were never going to tell anybody this story. You know? <laughs> so it's been 50 years. So I guess it's okay. You know? but, but that's, yeah. that's how I became a tank commander. And like that. Um, there, there was a, I want to tell another uh, a really good leader it was when we were in the Gulf in the, in the first Gulf War. Uh, we had a company commander and we had a really good company. I, I, we were able to uh, kind of hand pick the people we wanted in our company because the company I went to, remember I, I told you I was sick and I had mm-hmm. gone to a different company and they only had like 40 guys in the company. So there was another company that I'd previously been in that was being disbanded. So I, I, uh, our quarterback was in that company. So I told him to give me a list, like 50 people, you know, that we want. So we moved the 50 best people over to with us. And so we, we go to the Gulf and like 30 days prior to the, uh, the start of the war, the ground war, um, my company commander gets selected for major, which is a good thing. And so he, but, he, he was moved down to H&S Company. And so we were told we were getting a captain right off the division staff. So the first thing you're thinking is, oh my God, you know, what, what is this? Mm-hmm. You know, right before game day, we get, a new, we get a new quarterback. Well, as it turns out, the guy was probably one of the best people you'd ever want to meet. Uh, captain Roberson was his name. Mm-hmm. And what really, really uh, made him the special leader that he was, was he used to be a detective in the Portland Police Department. Wow. So he had been in firefights and he had been in stressful situations. And our company was the lead 
uh, company of the, of the task force we were assigned to. So we had to clear the minefields, create the lanes, you know, and, and, and Captain Robeson was absolutely perfect. Hmm. You know, never lost, because you could tell on the radio, no matter how hard you try to hide it, you could tell on the radio when somebody's panicking. Right. And that never occurred to me with Captain Robeson. He was, he uh, led us across the, the minefields and I, I told you the story about uh, Sergeant Major Burnett right. uh, diving into the trenches and, you know, everything, everything went according to plan, perfect. And, you know, and it was, it was just, I, 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 could, I could never emphasize how important it is that, that, that the leader, any leader at any level, maintain their composure because everybody's looking at you, wanting to know, what do we do? How are we supposed to act? You know, because the troops have never been in a situation like this. And Captain Roberson was absolutely awesome. And um, I had, he, he became a Lieutenant Colonel. I don't know what went beyond that, but he, whatever he got, he deserved it. Because one of the traits that I, I really admire about him is he listens. You know, like I said, we had a, our first sergeant was a tanker and he had been on the net team, you know, and, and uh, this was his first assignment as a first sergeant. He was a 400 pound bench presser, you know, and, and he and I have known each other for years and, and Captain Roberson would listen to us, you know, not that he did everything we said, but at least he listened. Right. And then he made a decision on what to do. And as far as um, uh, organizing our, our trains for supplies and organizing the, the company in different ways. You know, I, my hat's off to him. The guy did a great job, you know, and um, I think being a detective on the, on the Portland police really helped him a lot, you know. Um, you know, talking about doing a great job, uh, since, since the interview, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and a lot of people that I respect tremendously. And uh, although you and I have never worked together, uh, I came in, you know, quite a few years after you, after you had retired, a lot of the people that you had trained and people that worked for you became my leaders. And I have the absolute utmost respect for, for so many of them. And the way that they speak about you and your leadership just speaks volumes as to who you are. And, and you talked a little bit about last, last interview about some of the, some of the traits that you had and your focus on the warrior ethos and your focus on football and your focus on the importance of sports and, you know, what you do on the football field will most likely transcend into combat. Um, I mean, I think that's a proven, proven fact. What, what other leadership traits did you kind of put in your tool ba toolbox from all these great leaders that, that, that you're saying now, but what, what was something that, that, that you kind of focused on that made you who you are? You know, I, I always believed that you just got to break it down to things to the simplest form. You know, um, it's nice to stand up and, and I'll give you an example. Um, Captain Roberson was giving his five paragraph order, you know, at like one o'clock in the morning before we started across the LOD. And, you know, it was detailed, perfect. You know, any, you know, uh, uh, instructor in any school will probably say this is the most thorough, complete five paragraph order you ever want to get. But when he got done, all the troops looked at me and said, Top, we don't understand exactly what we're supposed to do. Hmm. And I said, look, just keep this in mind. We're over here. They're over there. That's a country that doesn't have a football team. They don't, <laughs> they don't deserve to live. That's honestly got truth. I said, they just don't deserve to live. So let's go kick their ass. They said, okay, Todd, we got it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, sometimes that's just kind of the way, you, I'm not saying that's always the best way to go, but, you know, the, you have to, one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit later, I have a, a segment on developing staff and CEOs, but um, one of the things that you always have to be prepared for is be flexible, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and that's why I, 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 I like maneuver warfare so much because you see, you see a situation, you seize the moment, and then you call it in and tell people what you did, you know, and, and today's Marines, Whenever I'm around an active duty Marine, or I'm just, I'm odd. The kids today are smarter. You know, they, they, they think differently than we do, but when the chips are down, they'll come through. Uh, that's been my experience anyway, on a number of occasions. But 
you have to be flexible. You have to, you have to learn how to talk to people, you know, and it, it depends who your audience is. You know, you, you gear your vocabulary and you like your level of enthusiasm. And, and I think I was telling you, if I, if we were here just talking to tank guys, I'd be beating on a table, you know, throwing chairs and everybody would love it. But I'm hoping that some people that are opposed to tanks are listening to our conversation and will rethink their position, you know, after hearing a number of people talk about it. So, uh, you know, and that's just being flexible. Trust me, it's not me. You know, I would prefer to be fired up, throwing chairs, kicking over trash cans. That's just me. But, right. you know, uh, you just, again, you just, and I think that's, that's the real trait, one of the real traits that I've always tried to, to do for myself. But the message that I've always, I mean, forever, is find a way to win. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when you're on the battlefield, you know, sometimes the answer doesn't come out of the manual. You know, sometimes the answer comes, just things just pop in your head. You know, you see something, you seize the moment, you make it happen, and good things come to an end. You know, but if, but if, you're, if you're flexible, and not have, you know, when you're in a firefight, uh, the most common thing is tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. You know, you get focused on what you're doing and you're just going to kick their ass. But if you're the leader, you can't afford tunnel vision. You've got to be able to look around and see the whole thing. Even if you're, whether you're a tank commander or a platoon commander or, you know, a company commander or the commanding general, mm-hmm. you got to see the whole picture, you know, and you have to understand what's going on on your left and what's going on on your right and find your role that you could play to fit in there. But in the end, the bottom line is you got to find a way to win. And that comes in many forms. And that's, that's where, you know, you, you want your Marines to be conformative and, and you know, to, to lockstep and a lot of things, but we're all individuals and we have different ways of, of dealing with different kinds of people. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, when, when you're, when you're assessing your talent, I guess is the way to put it, you know, you gotta know how to get the best out of each Marine. And it's not, in fact, it's almost always, it's never the same for any two people. You know, some people, you know, you just say, you know, you put your arm around and say, you know, hey, Corporal, you know, this is what we need to do. Okay, top, no problem, off we go. Other guys, you gotta take them behind a tank, be a little more convincing to them. Mm-hmm. You know, Article 5 of the UCMJ, maybe. <laughs> And, and that's, that's what you got to do. But the bottom line is, again, it just keep it simple and find a way to win. And, and that's, that's the best answer I can give you. And I've been very fortunate that the people that have been over me over the years, most of them, the, when I was a, when I went through the drill, I was a sergeant and I had a lot of gunnies uh, as senior drill instructors over me and as serious gunnies. You know, and, and I, I, I give them a lot of credit because I was a hard case. But one of my series guns, Gunny Dickerson, once pulled me aside and was going to counsel me. And after he got done, he, he says, you know, he said, I would much rather uh, throw a, a bucket of water on you over top you to calm you down rather than have to build a fire on your ass to get you going. <laughs> so, again, I mean, that's an example of him adjusting to do what he t- had to do with me to get me to go in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I've, I've been very fortunate that I've had a lot of people that have, that have uh, handled me that way. And I pass it on down through the ranks. And I hope that yeah, a, lot of, a lot of leaders will um, understand that all of us are different. Mm-hmm. Find a way to get the most out of each person, you know, and, um, whether you're coaching them, whether you're their platoon sergeant, or just the guy in the barracks, whatever, you know, and this, you're not manipulating people, you're being a leader. So that, that, that would answer that question. Uh, you, you, touched, about, you touched on one of the things that uh, this channel um, was, was attempting to bring out, and, and I think we did in, in, in quite a few episodes, but, uh, uh, you know, you talked about the tanker way and, and, and what you know, who, who is a tanker and what makes up a tanker and why, why are tankers special? And I, you know, early on, I was trying to get that message out because quite frankly, a lot of our tankers were going other places. 
whether it be, you know, civilian employment, getting out of the Marine Corps, or whether it be going to another unit, you know, and I thought it was important to talk about, you know, what, what, what is the package of a tanker? What can they expect? Well, and some, some of the things that I think we brought out was hard work, dedicated. And, and I mean, you summed it up right there. You, you said, you know, a willingness to win. Um, yeah. You know, and because uh, the Marine Corps is made up, I think, at least has been my experience, of people who come from really pretty rough backgrounds. You know, uh, I had a recruit one time that was from New York City and he spent his entire senior year sleeping under the hood of a car mm -hmm. in a junkyard. You know, I know a retired master gunny that at 15 years old, he lived in a barn mm -hmm. and he had to work his way through school and he retired a master gunny. The Marine Corps is full of people like that. I mean, you can't hardly talk to a person that comes from a, you know, a normal family. They're all have, have their stories and they're looking for a home. And uh, once they find it, Marines especially, but I think all people really want to be disciplined, you know, and they want to be on a winning team, but nine times out of 10, they don't know how, you know, they don't know what winning means because they've been sleeping under a hood of a car or, living in a barn and they've never experienced, you know, and that's, that's why I get back to athletics being so important, you know, because you can have a lot of winners out there and they, they learn what winning is like, because you have to learn how to handle winning as well as handle losing. And especially on the battlefield, second place really sucks. You know, if you're on a battlefield, you know, and so with, with all these different Marines coming from so many different backgrounds, and they find a home and it is for me, you know, they, they like the discipline and, and they, but one thing I think that people sometimes are a little afraid to admit is who they are. In other words, if you're, a, if you're a, a tanker and you've been in and I'll, I'll, I'll tell this that I've always thought that it takes about 10 years to really get it in the Marine Corps, you know, where you really understand you know, and that means that, you know, you've been a, worked your way up as a sergeant, been a tank commander, you've been on a drill field, you know, you've been a tank platoon sergeant, you know, you've been over, a couple overseas tours, maybe some combat. Now you're at about the 10 year mark. Now you get it, you know, whereas, uh, and, and once you do that, I, I think it really, inside yourself, you have to tell yourself that I am a warrior. I, I live the life, you know, I do the things that I do and, and, and admit to yourself that this, this tank thing, it's just not what I do. It's not my job. This is who I am. Right. You know, I am a tank commander. I am a tank loader, whatever. And, and take pride in that. You know, I, I think one of the most honest things that, or the most important thing that you could do in your self-development program is you gotta be honest with yourself. Hmm. You know, uh, you see on, on TV where people go to combat and they come home and they say, well, how could you kill all those people, you know, whatever. Well, I'm here to tell you, when I was 19 years old, I killed 122 people. And I have no regrets about any of them and I never felt bad about killing any. Hmm. Anyone who's got a gun pointed at me and they're trying to kill me, I got no problem with this at all. You know, so get over this thing of you're killing human beings because you're not. A terrorist is not a human being. You know, human beings don't blow up little, little kids at the Boston Marathon. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, you know, uh, they're, they're communists. They're not normal people. You know, so get over this thing of that you're killing innocent people. You're killing evil. Mm -hmm. And you have to accept the fact that there is evil in the world. And it's people like us that are assigned to end it. You know, to seek them out, find them wherever they hide, and just do what you got to do. And, and I think the honesty and looking in the mirror and being satisfied with what you see every day is it's, it goes beyond what your job is. Well, you, you know, a lot, of, a lot of really good Marines just do their four years and they get out. You know, and just in, in my company at Pendleton, we had one guy became a, a police chief in uh, New Jersey. Another guy is a, a fire captain in Montclair, New Jersey. You know, people are, do business successful 
you know, have their own companies, you know, and a lot of them became sergeant majors and master gunners, you know, so where you go for a living, it, it isn't part of the equation. It's what's inside of you, you know, and even people that are not tankers there. I mean, there's a lot of warriors in the Marine Corps that are not tankers, you know, but there's also a lot of people that they're just afraid to admit it. You know, I mean, what, what's, what's the big deal? You know, this is who I am. And I think that you should be proud that you have acknowledged, you know, I, I get it. I, I know who I am because if that, then it doesn't matter what anybody else says, what anybody else does, I know who I am and I'm moving straight ahead because I'm going to find a way to win. <laughs> you know, if you're a businessman, the same concept, find a way to friggin' win, you know, or if you're fighting fires or you're arresting people or, you know, or like today, you're in Boulder, Colorado, arresting some guy who just murdered 10 people in a 7-Eleven. You know, the hell with them. You do what you do because of who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I just think that's very important. So, for myself, I, uh, I want to talk about the two best jobs that I ever had in the Marine Corps. Please. One was uh, when I was a drill instructor, I became a senior drill instructor as a sergeant. Wow. And that's that's very rare. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had a, a force recon guy and I, uh, another Marine as my assistants. And we just took a pact. That we are never going to lose to a staff NCO on anything. We're going to eat faster than they do. We're going to get up quicker than they do. We're going to take showers. We're going to win close combat. We're going to do it. And we did. And we, we kicked ass. You know, and it was just such... For me, just personally, it was, it was fun being a sergeant, taking all these staff and seals to the mat. You know, that, that, that was our goal. You know, and, and my other uh, favorite job was being a gunny on float. To me, and this is just my own personal opinion. I, I don't blame anyone else if they should have feel differently. But I just can't imagine why a Marine, a single Marine especially, wouldn't want to go on float. I, I just, that boggles my mind. And because I, I, I tell my guys that, you know, back in 1775, Marines were aboard naval ships. They were making amphibious landings in foreign countries. They were pulling liberty in exotic ports. And here we are again, 200 and some odd years later, doing the same exact thing. What's the problem with this? Mm -hmm. You know, and most people, you know, once, once they understand what this is all about, you know, you're gonna like, you go to the Med, going to be all over the Mediterranean. You're going to land in all these different countries. And I'll tell you, so we landed in, I think it was France, and it was a totally topless beach or nude beach. And we had been at sea for a long time. Mm -hmm. and we landed at, you know, at sunrise, and there's all these naked women on the beach. And my Albert, it took us 30 minutes to get off the beach. <laughs> 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 you know? And, you know, that was just one of those things that, you never expect that to happen, but right. you no, know, it was a nice perk. You know, we, <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were sailing uh, uh, over in, in the area of Spain and, and there's two islands over there, Palma Mallorca and, uh, and uh, another one, I can't remember what it is, but that's like the rich and famous kind of places go mm. and, and, and uh, the jet setters. Well, there was a, a, a big sailing yacht sailed right past us, got up as close as our ship as they could get and all the women were laying out totally naked. Hey, come on guys, come on, jump on the ship, you know, cause they knew we couldn't do it, you know. Right. And then they just sailed off, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta have a little humor once in a while to kind of break up the, the tension. Mm -hmm. But uh, another, my, my third job, uh, my a civilian job that I had, uh, I, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Buck Owens, the country singer. Well, he, he, he's from Bakersfield, California. And that's where we lived before we moved here to Texas. And I worked at his club. I was a bouncer. And my, my job when we had shows was I was the um, uh, bodyguard for all the entertainers when they would come in. And one night we had this uh, very famous country singer named Daryl Worley came in. And uh, his manager was a uh, Green Beret who had served in Vietnam. Mm. And so... Uh, Daryl was going to do two shows. So between shows, I was talking with the manager and I told him, you know, I'd, I'd like you to just tell Daryl how much I appreciate him talking about pay 
patriotism and the, you know, uh, veterans and all that. And he said, well, come on. He said, let's, let's go talk to them and you tell them yourself. So we're back stage and I'm telling him my story, you know, and, and uh, I, I said, you know, I said, if I had time, I'd call my wife and invite her down to see the show. And, and Daryl Warby looks at me and he goes, you want me to call her for you? <laughs> I said, absolutely. <laughs> so Daryl gets on the phone. Well, my wife is not a country person. Mm. So she gets, he get my, he calls my wife and my wife's just about ready to hang up on him. Mm. Thinking, you know, this is a crank call or something. And he goes, no, no. He said, I'm, I'm down here at the Crystal Palace with your husband. He said, why don't you come on down and see the show and be my guest? So she does, she throws on her boots and runs, comes down to Crystal Palace. And Daryl Worley himself went and got a table, a chair, and put it center mass, front <laughs> row. My wife sat down as his guest. And That's pure saw the show. And, and Daryl Worley he stopped the show halfway through and he said, I want to introduce you to this Marine tank commander, you know, and I and brought me up there. And you know, I mean, he didn't have to do any of this, mm. you know, but he's one of the really, really great guys. Mm. And uh, they're not all like that, right. but he, he certainly was. And that was, that was a lot of fun. I, I was Buck's bodyguard for a while and his son uh, his bodyguard. And uh, I met a lot of interesting people and that was a, a lot of fun working there. Fortunately, it's kind of a family place. And I didn't have to do much bouncing, but uh, other than that, it was all good. Um, let me see, what's next on my list here of things to talk about? Oh, uh, when I came back from the Gulf, I was, uh, I was running tank school at Fort Knox. And fortunately, I was loaded with excellent tank commanders. All of them had been to the, been to the war and they, they were all veterans. They're all really, really good instructors. But we had one guy, Sergeant Arnold, who was uh, from South Dakota. And uh, he got into powerlifting and he, we would go to meets together. And after two years of lifting, he had set a world's record in the squat of 800 pounds. Imagine that. And he weighed probably two, 220, if that. He's kind of a short guy, but real thick. You know, and just after two years, he he won a he won a gold medal at the world championship, mm. and uh, he had squatted eight hundred pounds, and that's just phenomenal. You know, I mean, you know, and I always joked that probably when he was growing up in South Dakota, he probably had cows on the farm, and he would start lifting up a calf <laughs> every day, and then a couple years later, when the cow is fully grown, now he's still lifting them up. <laughs> right. But that that's that was good. We had a lot of good guys at Fort Knox. At the, mm. I uh, just, I, I really, the students used to joke that it was phase four boot camp. Mm. Uh, but I, I, I honestly believe that, that troops need supervision, you know, and, and once they complete boot camp, that doesn't mean that you just turn them loose and let them run wild. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you think of college freshmen, you know, first time the kid's away from home, he's in a fraternity. What kind of behavior does he have? <laughs> well, it would be unreasonable to expect anything different from our guys. So, you know, Monday through Friday, you know, I mean, it was Reveille, PT in the morning, you know, march to and from class. And then you could have weekends off. You could go up to Louisville and do whatever you want to do. But, you know, uh, they used to joke that it was phase four. Mm. Uh, I went to a conference one time at Quantico and a bunch of the SARG majors were there. They were, and the commandant came to visit. He was complaining, well, not complaining, but commenting about somewhere along the way we lose the Marines, you know, that we, you know, we get a good base out of boot camp, you know, and I was telling some of those sergeant majors, I said, you know, I, in my opinion, the problem is everybody feels like boot camp is some kind of initiation. And then once the initiation is over, you can just let them do what they want. Hmm. And that's nonsense. It's not an initiation. It's just basic training, underlying basic, mm -hmm. just learning, you know, and the first time away from home, you know, their chest is all huffy and puffy because they're Marines. You know, they're on an army base. That's <laughs> that's a recipe for disaster right there. So you got to keep them busy, you know, and keep them working. Give them a little bit of slack, like on the weekends, but Monday through Friday, you know, nose down, let's go to work, you know, let's make things happen. But that, that's, that was uh, uh, a lot of interesting 
people I've met over the years that went through with students have all, all seemed to have the same comment that it was phase four of boot camp, <laughs> which is good. They may not have liked it, but I liked it. <laughs> all so, well, you know, one of the things that the Marine Corps used to have, getting back on the sports track a little bit, is the Marine Corps used to have what they called the Pineapple Bowl, which was in Hawaii. And what they would do was at the end of football season, they would take the best team from Camp Pendleton and make an all-star team. Mm -hmm. They would take the all-star team from El Toro, the all-star team from Okinawa, and the all-star team from Hawaii. And you play this round robin, just, you know, whatever. Well, I was on the Okinawa team, and we'd been there about six months. And when you go from Okinawa to Honolulu, trust me, your mind is not on playing football. Mm. You know, this was the liberty capital of the world, and we all were going to take advantage of every single <laughs> minute we could. You know, and we went out and played horrible football. We beat Camp Pendleton, but El Toro handed us our butt. So we, we did not do very well, but it was a lot of fun. We spent two weeks in Hawaii that, you know, anybody else wouldn't have had to do. And, and that's the way it goes. But, you know, the, the, the one of the interesting things about uh, Marine football, when I was at Second Tanks, uh, we had a guy on our team named Trey, Tim Trey. He was a, a tow guy. And he got a, he didn't get a scholarship, but he got a walk-on invitation from the University of Nebraska, right off our team. Oh. You know, and he was about my size, he was maybe 5'11", so, 5'10", but he weighed about 260 at the time. Mm. And uh, he was, you know, he's a young guy. And he played, uh, I kept in contact with him, he played two years at uh, Nebraska as a center. He was on the scout team. He didn't play that much in the game, but he went to two Orange Bowls you know, got two orange, orange bowl rings and whatever. And awesome. All that came, came about because of Marine football. That's you know, awesome. That's, that's a good thing. But you know, Great one thing. of the one of the things kind of that uh, that I used to do, you were asking about different leadership things. Is we were at the machine gun range at Camp Pendleton one time, which is just down the road from Las Flores. And I yeah. I had these two Marines kind of had a little issue with each other. So I, I sent my, my home V driver back to the special services to bring me two pairs of boxing gloves. And I brought the gloves back and I gave each of them a pair of gloves. And I said, now you two guys go out there in the boonies somewhere and don't come back to your best of friends. <laughs> so I don't, I don't I, one, the one guy's name was McLeod and I don't remember the other guy's name, but he beat the living crap out of this guy. And to this day, I'm told they're still good friends. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure half the people watching this are going to criticize what I did, but it, it ended well. So that, that was all that really mattered. So that was I, think, that. I think we've lost that. I, I think we've lost that, that the, you know, go handle it like men, go, go be men. If you want to be a man, you want to, you know, and, and go handle it like men. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, and, you, you can debate all you want to, but you know, kind of when you get in a ring with somebody and duke it out, all that stuff goes by the side. Right. And speaking, I'm going to bring up a subject. That, yeah, feel free to edit this if you <laughs> think it's a little too much. But you know, there's a lot of a lot of talk about race nowadays. Mm. And I'll tell you what I what I saw in Vietnam on more than one occasion. Um, a Marine would get wounded. Let's just say a white Marine would get wounded. Mm -hmm. And the corpsman at time would give blood transfusions right there on the battlefield. A black Marine would lay right down next to him mm -hmm. and give a direct blood transfusion. And neither one of them complained about this or that. Right. You know, so I, I, when, I, when I hear things on TV or whatever, it, and I always go back to this, you know, that do away with the politics, take away all the, the showmanship. What really matters is you know, these guys laying side by side, one of them giving them blood to the other or vice versa. And then when it's over, it's over, you know, and nobody has any complaints or anything. Now, feel free to edit that if you think it's too much, but- No, I don't think so. I don't think that's, so at all. That's just the way it was. I'm reporting an incident. I'm, it's, it's not so much my opinion or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we talked about um, growing staff and COs. You know, and we talked about being on the, on the drill field and being overseas. And, you know, and I think a tour on each coast is a good thing because life is different on the East Coast than it is from the West Coast. And mm -hmm. people can say what they want to about being one Marine Corps, but it's different. 
And that's, uh, that's my opinion. And I think that, and that as you develop, you know, and we talked about this, I think a lot in the other video, stick your neck out there, you know, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you believe in something, you fight for it to the end. If you got a, one of your men that deserves a second chance, get him a second chance. You know, if he's a guy who believes you need to do him in right here and there, well, then do it. But there's a lot of good Marines out there that develop at a different pace. And you can see that with kids. You know, all kids don't grow at the same pace. Some of them learn faster. Some of them takes longer. You know, some of the kids you went to high school with, you put them on the top 10 or the bottom 10% in loser class. Turns out they're the guys that become millionaires or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, so we all develop at a different rate. Be smart enough to see what's good. Identify your talent. And then once you've identified it, stick with them. You know, and like I say, that guy in, in France that had a little too much to drink, you know, a lot of people would have just cut him off right there. And he would have never been able to reenlist because mm -hmm. he had a DUI, you know, but yet he retired a master sergeant and I'm proud as hell of him just for that, you know, and, and uh, staff and seals just I, I get very frustrated with a lot of them that are just willing to sit back and take orders you know that's a good thing but you got to have some input too and, and, a, and a, a gunny who tells me that his goal is to be the uniform regulations expert or, or something like that I'm not impressed mm -hmm. and your job is not to impress me but as a gunny you're somebody, mm -hmm. you know, and you should be a lot more involved in things other than how long should their belt be? You know, Lance Copa can read the uniform manual and in 10 minutes know everything you need to know about uniforms. A gunny has had probably over 10 years experience. You know, you know how to go on float, I hope. You know how to deploy. Because you just don't go get on the airplane. You got to pack up your pallet. You know, you got to know what goes on the pallet. You know, how, how tall it can be, how much it can weigh. You know, there's things you need to know. You got to be involved in the tactics, you know, and, and you got to have input, you know, not just a gopher for somebody, you know, and, and uh, you got to teach your staff sergeants about that. And your sergeants are watching, believe me, you know, and, 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 and the biggest leadership point that I think I can make is that it's like kids. You know, you, you talk to them over and over again, you talk to Marines and you just don't believe they're listening, you know, they're, but then all of a sudden, someday years later, out of their mouth comes the smartest thing you ever heard. <laughs> Where did you hear that? And they, so the point is that they are listening, mm -hmm. you know, and don't think that they're not, you know, I worked, I worked in a prison in California for a while and the thing that I try to get to head to every other CO out there was these inmates are just watching us every second of every day and they're looking for a weakness to exploit you. Mm -hmm. Don't give it to them, you know? And the same thing is when you're, when you're dealing with Marines, they are watching you every minute of the day and they're looking for the good things and they're looking for the bad things, you know, show them as much good stuff as you can. And, uh, all's well that will end well. Well, let me end this on one last thing. I think we've probably gone about an hour now. Yes, sir. Um, one of the truly great moments in my life was I got to see Bob Hope in the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Vietnam, uh, Bob Hope would be like in Da Nang or something. Da Nang was like Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know, or San Diego. It's a huge city. Mm -hmm. And we would get a quota, maybe send one person down there or whatever, but I, I never got to go see him. And, and then Beirut, um, I didn't get to see Bob. He came a different mm -hmm. year. But in the Gulf War, he came to us. Instead of uh, uh, us going down to a city, mm -hmm. he came around to all the different, because in a Humvee, you know, and he, uh, he, he did it. And just, it's like meeting John Wayne, you know, or Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. The toughest Marine is odd. By just this is pure Americana. Absolutely. You know, Bob Hope is as good as it gets. You know, I would defy anybody who has anything negative to say about him. You know, and whatever 
dark side there may be to them. I just don't care. The Bob Hope is Americana. And when, when me and, and the first sergeant were sitting there looking at, we were laughing. They go, man, this is, is, you know, we could die tomorrow because we've done all we can do today. We <laughs> see Bob Hope, you know, it's just absolutely incredible. So with that, I'll ask you if you have any final questions, but I, I think we've covered everything today. I think it's rather fitting that you uh, that you told that story sitting in front of an American flag, particularly yeah. particularly a historical one, um, because when I when I think of Americana, you know, I I I obviously associated with with the Marine Corps, and uh, as a tanker, you know, we are a part of that community, and and the opportunity to sit down with you now twice, to me is is meeting somebody that is absolutely a tanker inside and out. And, and these two, these two interviews and, and the experience that I've had with you, Master Guns has been, you know, really earth shattering. Um, so many leadership lessons, so many just great leadership lessons. Like you said, they're, you know, they're, they're on my level. They're, they're simple, they're to the point, they're usable and, and they're transferable and they're flexible and, and they're just, they're just solid. And, and that's who you are. And, and, and I knew that from talking to folks saying, you know, big top Graham, just, you got to talk to the man. You got to talk to the man. And, and I finally have had my experience and my opportunity and, and it has not let down in the slightest. It is my absolute honor to have you on the channel. And I thank you once again. Um, I am going to take a moment though, to talk to the subscribers and thank them as well. Uh, since you have been on, I've gotten quite a few new subscribers. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And uh, those who have not already done so, please do subscribe. Uh, that gives the channel momentum. If anybody knows how YouTube works, uh, the more subscribers and the more momentum, uh, the larger the reach is and more people will see these interviews over time. Um, so thank you for doing so. And uh, hit the notification bell for new episodes. Master Guns, I thank you so much. And, and you have parting comments. It's been my pleasure. Just find a way to win. That's all I want to tell you. Yes, sir. Semper Fi. Hoorah. <laughs>